Welcome to Following the Money Trail, Why Local Capital Matters, made possible thanks to support by your session sponsor, Czech Media. Thank you for joining this conversation, part of the second annual Rising Economy Week, an immersive virtual and in-person event hosted by the South Island Prosperity Partnership. This is just one of more than 20 sessions, building momentum for a more resilient, innovative, sustainable, and equitable post-COVID world. I'm Rob Germain from Czech Media, locally owned and operated by its employees for the past 12 years, and next week celebrating 65 years of broadcasting. Your moderator today is Christy Fairhome Mater. Christy is the Director of Innovation and Initiatives at Scale Collaborative. Since moving to Vancouver Island in 2011, Christy has been supporting the growth of the social economy sector through initiatives such as SE Catalyst, Thriving Nonprofits, and the British Columbia Social Procurement Initiative. Christy is an RSF integrated capital alumni, which helped expand Scale Collaborative's exploration into social finance and impact investing. Scale's Thrive Impact Fund was part of McConnell Foundation's Solutions Finance Accelerator and launched in June 2021. Now over to you, Christy. Thank you very much, Rob, and it's a pleasure to be here today. So I've been asked to set the local context and then invite our amazing panel speakers in to have a conversation about local and I'm going to say broader forms of capital can be connected into resilient and thriving communities and economies. So local economies are at the front lines of addressing complex environmental and social challenges. And we know that resources are needed in order to help innovators to bring these solutions to bear and to scale. Um, this session is called Local Capital Matters, and I'd like to add in order to achieve the positive social environmental impacts that we need. Scale Collaborative has been working in the region since 2014, and our overall vision is to have a Vancouver Island that has a strong social economy. We talk about social economy in terms of the three pillars, social enterprise, social procurement, and social finance. And key to that is that local capital is mobilized and that there's a strong and resilient social enterprises that are ready and, and there to give to, to do business with, and to invest in. In terms of the local con context, I want to acknowledge that there are many people and organizations across our region who are doing innovative and impactful work in building a strong, resilient, and sustainable economy. In the area of social enterprise, Project Zero is incubating circular economy organizations. Coast Capital Innovation Center at UVic is bringing student ideas to life. Thriving Nonprofits Program is focused on revenue diversification and enterprising nonprofits. And Scales Pilot, the Business Legacies Incubator, is helping nonprofits acquire existing businesses and transition them into social enterprises. Community ownership is a key pillar and one that we're going to focus on today, today's session. In the area of social procurement, the City of Victoria helped found the BC Social Procurement Initiative, which has 30 plus local governments and institutional purchasers and growing, working to connect their procurement dollars to achieve social and community benefits. 2019, the local governments in the CRD spent close to $900 million. That's a lot of capital that can be aligned to achieve the goals of a social, resilient, and sustainable economy. I want to give a shout out to the local members, Souk, Esquimalt, Victoria, and the CRD. And finally, social finance. There are so many different ways to flow aligned and local capital into good projects from grants, gifts, direct investments, community bonds to flexible and patient debt and venture capital. And scales become intimately familiar with social finance, first with experiencing and understanding some of the current capital exact gaps that exist for social enterprises, and then learning what's possible. And this fall launched a Vancouver Island place-based fund, the Thrive Impact Fund, to provide flexible and patient capital to impact organizations and social enterprises. We're making our initial investments and so excited about the opportunities to support impact organizations and social enterprises in the region and across Vancouver Island. And of course, there's more to be done, more people and communities innovating and doing great work and more inspiration to be had. With that, I'd like to welcome two people that are having an outsized impact in their communities and across Canada, and I'm gonna say the US as well, for wide ranging positive benefit and outcomes. Zita Cobb is an eighth generation Fogo Islander, founder and CEO of Shorefast and innkeeper of the Fogo Island Inn. A registered char Canadian charity, Shorefast uses business-minded means to help secure economic and cultural resilience for Fogo Island, Newfoundland, a centuries-old settler fishing community off Newfoundland's northeast coast. 
Dita graduated high school in Fogo Island before leaving home to study business in Ottawa. Following a subsequent su successful career in high tech, Zita returned to Fogo Island to help grow another leg on the island's struggling economy to complement its ever important fishery. And Bill Young is chairman of Social Capital Partners. Bill founded Social Capital Partners in 2001 and has been one of the leading voices in promoting social finance in Canada. He also sits on a variety of boards and advisory boards for social enterprises and community organizations. Bill previously spent 20 years in the private sector, primarily as CEO of Hamilton Computers and Optel Communications Corp. He holds an honors BA from University of Toronto, an MBA from the Harvard Business School, and is a chartered accountant. In 2013, Bill was appointed as a member of the Order of Canada for his achievement as a social entrepreneur and philanthropist. I will start the conversation with a few questions from our speakers, and just over the halfway mark, we'll turn to questions from the audience. You could submit a question at any time through the Zoom Q&A below this video. This session is being recorded and you could submit your question anonymously if you prefer. To interact with the attendees, you can use the Zoom or Volvo chat. The production team will monitor the chats and Q&A for those joining us through the app. And finally, if you're posting your takeaways to social media, please use the hashtag Rising Economy Week 2021. Great. So in the introduction, I touched on the importance of social enterprise and community ownership to local economies. Bill, Social Capital Partners has been around for 20 years and has done deep work in social enterprise development and scalability, social finance through your community employment loan program. And now you're focusing on increasing access to business ownership and quality employment. Can you share more about the work you're currently doing and why you've decided to focus on employee ownership in particular? Yes. Um, thank you, Christy. And uh, it's great to be here and, and uh, great to find out that Zeta is an eighth generation Fogo Islander. That's really impressive. Um, so more to unpack there for sure. But yeah, we, we um, you know, as you mentioned, Christy, we, we, we started in social enterprise and loved social enterprise and did these community employment loan programs. But we had a, we had kind of a eureka moment about three or four years ago in social capital partners history, where we kind of said almost all of us who are thinking about this inequality issue or trying to address it in one way, shape or form writ large, almost all of us are working on income solutions. Ours was about meaningful employment, finding you know, meaningful jobs for single moms or new immigrants or at-risk youth, all, all of which is great, but it's an income solution. And, and as you read about inequality, often the solutions that are put forward are, well, we gotta fix minimum wage laws and make sure they're livable wages, or we need things like universal basic income. So everybody knows they can put food on the table, or we need to change the tax system and tax the wealthy more and redistribute better all of which are solutions we are in favor of and think are important and good. But the Eureka moment was, it dawned on this trouble with income solutions is the first time an unexpected event comes into the lives of someone who's the beneficiary of one of these income solutions, kind of like a global pandemic, for instance, the rug gets pulled out from under them. And, and those of us with assets, um, almost all of us are better off today, financially, than we were when the pandemic started. And those without any assets, uh, yes, there have been income supports put in place by governments, et cetera, but guess what happens when those uh, income supports stop? They start from square one again, because they have no wealth. And so we said to ourselves, we gotta figure out the best solution for building wealth. You know, that is why. And so we did a big pivot and, and probably more of that will come out in, in the Q&A, but, but we came across this legislation that's existed for 40 years in the US that has created powerful incentives around creating employee ownership. Those incentives include, if you're a business owner and sell to your employees, you can eliminate your capital gains tax. And if you operate one of these 100% employee owned businesses and you've distributed the shares the way the regulator wanted, which means to everyone and not disproportionately to senior management, you as a company pay no income tax. Means there are now 6,500 of these employee owned businesses in the US. And it's like we've had a randomized control trial um, because they've been around for 40 years. That's allowed the academics to say, okay, how do these businesses perform? Um, why don't we compare them to their traditionally owned peers? And guess what? Uh, when they do that, turns out they grow faster, 
they're more profitable, they default less, they stay in their communities longer, they lay off fewer people in pandemics or recessions, and they pay their employees more before you take into account the wealth that comes from the share ownership. And when you take that into account, they've been this powerful wealth creating engine for people who had no pathways to wealth otherwise. There are now 14 million Americans in those ESOP plans or have been in those ESOP plans through the history. It's created more than $1.4 trillion of wealth for those more than $100,000 per person. And just from an anecdotal story, there's uh, uh, a grocery company headquartered in Idaho that was an early adopter of this legislation. It has created 400 frontline millionaires of people who are stocking shelves or, or cashiers. So this is a powerful wealth creating engine. And that's why we're focused on employee ownership. Um, and, and both in terms of how do we get more of it? How do we bring it to Canada? Great, thanks Bill. And that was my question that we're gonna see is how do we bring it to Canada? But we'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, Zita, welcome from Newfoundland. And I love the quote on your website and I'm just gonna read it out because I find it really inspiring. We exist in relationship to the whole, the whole planet, whole of humanity and whole of existence. It's our job to find ways to belong to the whole while uploading the specificity of people in place. Um, I'm wondering if you can give us a bit more background about the place and the people where Shorefast is located, an overview of the challenges that Shorefast mm -hmm. is working to solve, and kind of just what, what you've accomplished and what's in process. Okay, Christy, hello, and, and to you, Bill. Actually, I arrived in Ottawa last night, so I left Twogo Island yesterday because I have uh, some things to do here, but um, I'm, I'm never spiritually away from home, even if I'm physically mm -hmm. away. Um, so Fogo Island is, is uh, as is often said about small islands, it's a good proxy for a small planet because small islands are really good places to understand cause and effect. And uh, we, uh, the people who live on the island today, are people who are descended from uh, 400 years ago, people came from England and Ireland and settled in pursuit of cod. And uh, I'm an eighth generation Fogo Islander Bill, and we can talk about that. And I can tell you, in, I, I'm 63 years old and I've lived in three centuries because until I was 10, I lived on Fogo Island in a time that we had no electricity, no running water, and we'd only been a part of Canada for 10 years at that point. And that was the 19th century in a way. And we were into our fishing people. We had no money. We had no banks. We traded our fish. So what's called a truck system. So <clears throat> I grew up without money. And I had parents who had deep social logic and deep ecological logic, but no economic logic in the, in the way we know economic logic today. And so when these <clears throat> enormous uh, factory draggers came uh, in the mid 60s and local people like my parents couldn't understand what the heck was going on and why would anyone in their right mind uh, fish until day and night until the fish were gone, my father actually figured out uh, eventually, before he died of a broken heart, he said, they must be turning the fish into money, even though he just had a vague concept of money. And uh, without knowing it, he actually used the word financialization, which I might add, if we don't get to talking about housing, what's going on in our with housing now. And so that was really the 20th century, the arrival of the, the kind of worst uh, form of, of industrialization and its impact on the places we live. And my father, who really couldn't read or write, said, I, you know, you got to go and figure out how this money system works, because if you don't figure it out, it's going to eat everything we love. I, I feel like that was a prediction. And I feel like in my life, it's kind of coming true. And strange, we are strange creatures, we humans, because we are embodied creatures, like every one of our heads has to lie on a pillow some place at night, but we forget geography. And we have invented tools in notably money and let's say network computing, let's put it that way, that really have given us another life besides our physical embodied life, which is a virtual life. And these tools kind of run amok. And I think what we need to see is the ascendance of geography, which is where we are embodied and we live together in some kind of a tangle that satisfies our social selves. So I think the whether it's Fogo Island or any any physical community in, on the planet, we've got to, in a way, play a little bit more defense because we need to exist as we do. Uh, and that's immutable. Place is immutable. We need to exist in that way, but we also almost need a digital twin for every community. 
uh, in order for it to exist in the, in the virtual world. So I think reconciling those two things and our and from most fundamental to that is money and where it goes and what it does and who owns it. Zita, when we were just chatting briefly before this session, you know, and I think you're talking about this here about how the money system takes, you know, um, you quoted a childhood rhyme to me, which I think uh, crystallizes that really, really beautifully. I'm wondering if you want to quote about it, but then talk about how the money system takes and why we want to reverse it and how we can do that. Yes. So yeah, the, the rhyme is, and everybody must know this one. It's, hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. A little dog laughed to see such sport and that dish ran away with the spoon. And so somehow that is, is I think, what's happened. Uh, and we don't have to go talking about Friedman and, and all of that, but somehow, uh, yeah, the dish and the spoon need to come home um, because they too are embodied and need a place to live. And so somehow what we have allowed happen, uh, and, it, and it's a, obviously a very complex and complicated uh, set of things. It's not like there's a single thing to point to, but a lot of it has to do with deregulation and the role of governments changing and the and court and the corporate concentration and on and on and on and on and on and 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 a you know a false belief that if 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 somebody makes lots of money over here it's all going to trickle down and we're all going to be fine. Of course mm -hmm. that doesn't work um, as we know. And so if you go back to Fogo Island for a moment, I mean fundamentally uh, every like the wealth we had in in Port Newfoundland or coastal Newfoundland was fish. And that wealth was effectively taken away by marauding bands of factory trawlers. Now, not to say we weren't implicated as well, because we were. So it, it's, again, you know, we should remember this quote, Christy, it's from Stanislav Lech, which is, every snowflake in an avalanche pleads not guilty. So we're, nobody gets off free here. Uh, so, but, it, but in any event, it, so uh, basically our wealth was taken. Uh, and the consequence of that, and Joey Smallwood, you know, I'm sure there's a special place in hell for him. He was the premier of Newfoundland at the time. Uh, he, his plan was, well, let's just resettle everybody to bigger communities where we can get some kind of a low paying job for them, where they will lose their dignity, lose their relationship with place. And, but, you know, they're going to be happy. Right. Uh, so that doesn't work. But I mean, if you see the migration of people on this planet right now. Uh, that seems to still be plan A in too many places. So the, so the, really the question for all of us humans to figure out is how do we reverse this flow? So instead of kind of strip mining place in order to harvest a economic value for some distant owner of capital, how do we get it, how do we reverse it so that money flows back into place and is invested in ways that creates local wealth as Bill was talking about. I love what Bill is doing. And I think um, and I don't know, Bill, you and I can have this debate, what's better, employee ownership or community ownership? Because I think they're both pretty powerful. But that is basically, we're not going to make a better world by making everybody an economic migrant. Uh, we're going to make a better world by allowing it, making it possible for us humans to make meaning because we are also meaning making creatures. Um, and, but place has a role to play in that. Thank you. Um, yeah, so let's build on that with with Bill, and we'll we'll set up to talk about employee ownership and community ownership. So, but Bill, can you give an example of something that you're working on uh, directly, where new forms of capital or, you know, new forms of ownership can can lead to the kind of impacts that we're talking about? And you said you had a specific deal that you wanted to to share with us today. Yeah. So, um, you know, back to uh, and and, and I, I should you know I have to turn my mic on mute so I'm glad I remembered to turn it off because you know Zeta cracks these jokes and I've got a very strange laugh so that's you know might might knock off a lot of the people who are listening on the, on the one but but and and you know I, I think it'd be wonderful to have the debate about community uh, ownership versus employee ownership because it'd be a debate I'd be delighted to lose <laughs> I think both are wonderful you know in the sense of um, you know we need both but you know, back to what I was saying on employee ownership, um, where, you know, there's 6,500 and, and they've worked for every stakeholder. You know, the, 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 this is the, it's evidence-based. It's the randomized control trial. The results are in and it doesn't work just for employee, I mean, business owners and employees. It works for communities. It works for, you know, our economy because they grow faster, et cetera. It's a much better way to share the fruits of the economy. And so we wondered, well, wait a sec, these have done so well why in the last year we had data with only 200? 
business ownership conversions that went to employees and all the rest went to private equity and strategic buyers and all those forms that that widen the wealth gap between the 99 and the one where, where the fruits are just distributed to this very few as opposed to uh, many. Um, and we kind of concluded it's because there isn't the right form of financing in place and that um, I won't get into the technical details of this uh, unless anyone's interested, but we came to the conclusion, wait a sec, this would be a perfect investment for pension funds. And pension funds have never uh, financed an employee ownership, an ESOP transaction before. And be because it needs longer forms of capital, more patient forms of capital, pension funds can be more flexible because they don't pay taxes uh, so they can you know, accrue interest as opposed to insist on cash interest, all those things that can work in terms of the financing of one of these employee ownership transactions. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and then we stop to think about it and say, and, and by the way, aren't pension funds the stewards of the wealth of the 99% when you think about it? Shouldn't they, shouldn't this be right up their alley? And why don't we try and connect those dots? Um, because we have to get market share for employee ownership. They're only getting 200 out of all these, despite the fact that they work so well. And so we had this theory at about the same time, a large Canadian pension fund, Healthcare Workers of Ontario Pension Fund, actually knocked on our door and said, you know, we're interested in, uh, you know, in this impact investment space and ESG, and you guys know something about that. Have you got any ideas? And we said, yeah, we got one. And uh, they said, I think their first reaction was, don't you know markets are efficient? You know, that, that there aren't these opportunities out there that, you, you know, that where the dots haven't been connected. But tell you what, here's, here's our criteria. Here's a kind of uh, the kind of company we look for, the kind of EBITDA we need to see, which is the earnings before interest and taxes. This is the kind of interest rate we we need to get uh and this is the minimum check size and this is how much of you know the vendor note we need behind or the business owner's risk would still need to be there that the former business owner see if you can find us anything and on december 31 uh last year we ended up uh financing uh the sale of taylor guitars to its 1200 employees <laughs> taylor guitars is the largest acoustic guitar maker in the world. Um, it has 900 American employees, 300 Mexican employees. First time a pension fund has ever financed one of these deals. First time Mexicans have ever been included in one of these transactions. And interestingly enough, Taylor Guitars had their pick of lenders for financing this transaction. And the three finalists were one asset manager that manages more than $400 billion based in the US that's done lots of these, what are called ESOP transactions, which is short for the employee ownership transactions. Another one that manages more than 300 billion. And us, this combination of a Canadian pension fund that had never done an ESOP deal and a Canadian nonprofit that had never done an ESOP deal. And the reason we won was uh, one, we were right. And the pension fund can provide more flexible terms. So the interest rate wasn't better, but, but the way it was structured, it turned out the theory of change was right in terms of um, pension funds actually being able to be more flexible uh, in terms of the way they structure the financing. And the second reason is Taylor Guitars was founded by two gentlemen when they were 19 and 21. They are now 65 and 67. They care deeply about this company and its legacy and what it stands for. And they want to sell to their employees. But the other reason they chose us was they love what we're trying to do at Social Capital Partners, where it says, we got to take much more market share for this form of ownership. We've got to find lots more institutional capital so that this isn't sort of a tiny, you know, kind of fraction of the way uh, companies are owned and operated. We've got it to be much more significant. They've said, we want to be your poster child for this. And so just imagine the conversation when uh, they went through the debriefing in that 400 billion and 300 billion when they said, you lost to who? How many, you know, so, um, but those are the reasons, and it's why we're optimistic that a lot more of these can be done. Thanks, Bill. 
Zita, I wonder if you can bring in the community ownership angle into this and talk about, you know, what does community ownership, I mean, Bill's talking about employee ownership, what's the difference with community ownership and what do you see as being kind of like the rising desire and need and potential for these kind of models? I have to say, Builder, you have no bigger fan on this planet than me. Like, I just think you deserve way more credit than you get for what you're doing. And I'm going to push on those rocks with you. Uh, uh, we've gone a bit of a different route, which is this community ownership. So <clears throat> the way Fogo Island actually managed to hold on and did not get resettled on like many, many, many Newfoundland uh, coastal communities was because Fogo Islanders inspired or activated, I would say, by Memorial University and the National Film Board of Canada together in a partnership came together uh, and decided, like, help's not on the way. We got to do something. We got to do something here. So first they formed the Fogo Island Improvement Committee in, in 1966, 65, 66. And in 1967, they started the Fogo Island Cooperative Society. And not that the, that didn't make any more fish in the ocean, but it at least we had social capital, to Bill's use of words, uh, and came together as, as 10 communities on this little island. And once the co-op was set up, which is owned by the fishers and the people who work in the fish plant, uh, you know, we, we at least had a tool. And with that tool, the co-op figured out how to uh, adapt to the midshore fishery. Because we, for all those years, were inshore fishing people. We never went further than five kilometers off the coast. But they adapted to the midshore fishery where there were still cod. And over the years have adapted to crab because, you know, the ocean's got its own sense of order. And when the cod population declined, the things that cod eat grew uh, abundant, like crab and shrimp. And so we became fishers of crab and shrimp, and those are our main fisheries. But I am certain, and we, we say this all the time, if our fishery wasn't owned by a co-op, we wouldn't be on Fogo Island today because there's nothing efficient in using economic logic, because you really have to ask, what are we optimizing for? Uh, if you were, I don't know, pick some great big company, there's one going around buying up fish plants all over Newfoundland right now called Royal Greenland. I, I don't know those people, and I'm not speaking badly of the people, but I would suggest that their business model would not keep fish plants open on an island off the northeast coast of Newfoundland uh, because it's not financially efficient. But we're optimizing for community well-being and continuity, so it's a very effective uh, tool. And so we're still there because we're because our fishery is owned by a co-op. It's one of the biggest ones, I think, in the country. So when we were starting, we shore fast, so I founded something called Shorefast, which is a registered charity of Canada with uh, two of my many brothers. Uh, when we started in 2006, our goal was to put another leg on the economy and to do it in a way that uh, strength was helped strengthen the fishery, but really strengthen culture. Because the loss of the inshore fishery means there was a rupture in the continuity of culture and, and in our relationship with the ocean. And so um, our model is different, but effectively the same. The charity, Shorefast, created social businesses. So we have to keep a separation of church and state. Uh, and so the charity is the charity, but there's a separate board and a separate organization called Shorefast Social Enterprises that owns, but doesn't operate. I mean, the charity owns, but doesn't operate the Fogo Island Inn, which is probably our most well-known uh, enterprise. And it's a, it's a community owned business. Um, Fogo Island Fish, which really is about the cod making this fragile comeback and taking handline cod and selling them for a higher value and bringing as much money back home as possible. We do a lot of, with that business, a lot of disintermediation, you know, breaking up the many pairs of hands that something uh, travels through and everybody takes a bite and then the community ends up with not much. Uh, and we have a furniture business and they are, so the business are owned by the charity whose mandate is the well-being of the island and operated by something called Shorefast Social Enterprises. So it's it. So basically, Fogo Island is a hotbed of uh, community ownership. I will also say every other business on the island is owned by someone who lives on the island. And and Bill, you probably know these numbers better than I do. But as I understand it, eighty percent of the businesses in Canada are family owned, and sixty. And I think it accounts for sixty percent of our GDP. Not that I'm advancing GDP as a measure of anything useful. Uh, and 80% of those businesses, uh, the SME part, are going to change hands in the next decade. I am frightened to death 
of what is going to happen because those families have deep attachments to place. They put their heads on pillows. They care about the places they're in. And like Bill described, Taylor Guitars. This to me is what we should be getting money off the sidelines, the wall of capital that exists and uh, uh, preventing it from just buying stuff up for the purpose of extracting, but somehow enabling a transfer of uh, at least on our island, I can tell you, we have three businesses that I know need to change hands soon. And if they don't, they're either going to close or God forbid, uh, that which would be really bad, uh, um, or be owned by someone who doesn't live on the island or has no relationship with the island and really doesn't care about it except as a financial investment. None of these scenarios are very good. This is, I, I super am so excited by this conversation and you know some of the work that we've been doing is around shifting assets into nonprofit and charity ownership here on Vancouver Island. And one of the things in, in mapping conversions and, and social conversions and community acquisitions um, and I just want to give a shout out to the Legacy Leadership Lab that was looking at this nationally at, at Canada level, is that um, there's a policy, I was looking at what happened in the UK, and they have a policy which is a right to buy policy that allows communities to indicate and identify where there's community assets and ownership opportunity, and they can, they can name it, and then that allows the community, when it comes up for sale, the community has an opportunity to gather its resources and to acquire, or to gather its employees or to acquire. Going back to that, we need more of this in Canada. I'm wondering if both of you could give us an overview of what do you think is the enabling climate to allow for more of these kind of conversions and acquisitions to take place? If you had your wish for one change in Canada to make this be more of regular, the predominant model, what would it be? And I'll start with Zita and then go to Bill. You know, I was actually, I told Bill this this morning, I'm actually thinking about um, getting a tattoo. Uh, and the tattoo on my forehead, it would say, it matters. And here it would say, who owns what? And so the, the thing, we're working on a community economies pilot project and, in, and actually the South Island Partnership is a partner in that with us. And one of the things we are looking at is uh, how we can get a better grip on data uh, and particularly community level data and wanting, uh, we really wanna build a network and imagining that every community has a kind of community hub where we can put the collect and put the data that's most important. And, and I think one of the most important things is about ownership. And every, I think every community should have a ledger that simply tells us who owns what's in our geography, uh, whether it's a house or whether it's a business, because to your point earlier, Christy, about you know, this kind of right to know, right to buy. Like sometimes things change hands. You don't even know what's up for sale and before you know it, it's all over. Uh, so I think this kind of knowledge about who owns what and, and I, I think that um, I, I, I don't have an answer for what any particular government should do to say to regulate who owns what because I know that's dangerous ground and I, I'm old enough to remember the days of FIRA and all of that stuff. Uh, but I, I think making it visible is I think the, the first step in it. And then as citizens and as communities, we can you know, as, assert ourselves and, uh, and, and, assert, and, and do something. Great, thank you. Bill, what would be your, on your wish for making ESOPs happen all the time across Canada? Well, my first wish is for that tattoo to take place on Zeta's. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my second wish is, um, uh, you know, what, what we are trying to push for in Canada. Canada is one of the few developed countries in the world that has no enabling le legislation or targeted incentives to encourage employee ownership. Um, and uh, both the US and the UK, I mean, there's other examples around the world have put in place a dedicated trust structure. The reason why you need a dedicated trust structure, the trust actually holds the shares on behalf of the employees without getting too technical. But, you know, uh, the tr a dedicated trust structure allows sort of targeted incentives and specific rules around governance, et cetera. Um, both the US and the UK have successfully done that. So there's evidence-based ones uh, you know, to look at, and we can build something in Canada that takes, uh, you know, the best of both those. Um, 
it was very effective because after we did the Taylor Guitars deal, we went to the Canadian government and said, well, the reason why a Canadian pension fund and a Canadian nonprofit helped 900 Americans and 300 Mexicans uh, own their company, it's because it's so friggin' hard to do this here, you know? And you talk about building back better, you won't find a better tool than this, just in terms of that. And, and, and this works for every stakeholder, not just, and, and we said, by the way, to, to the Canadian government, uh, this actually has bipartisan support in the US. Do you need any further proof that this is a good idea? I mean, what else has bipartisan support in the US? I mean, so, um, you know, and that uh, we are working hard on that because we think, uh, you know, with this silver tsunami coming up that Zeta pointed out, just in terms of the number of businesses going for sale, there are so many good reasons to be encouraging this kind of form of ownership. And, and, and it actually appeared in the, uh, the, the budget, which was great. They, they actually, to our surprise, seem to be listening. And, and, um, and it actually, speaking of bipartisan, We've been trying to circulate this with all the parties. Um, and it was actually in the conservatives election platform where they said, no, no, we're not studying this uh, anymore. We're actually going to give uh, a capital gains break to business owners to do this. And we're implementing it if, if we're elected. So we think there's some momentum around this. Um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, we just need both community form and employee form of ownerships as, you know, hopeful <laughs> vaccines against <laughs> the forms of ownership that we are prevalent out there that have widened significantly the gaps between, you know, the well-off and not so well-off that we all know about over the last 30 years. And Bill, you know, do you know much about these, uh, the, U the UK has a body of legislation for what are called community interest corporations, CICs, um, and because I, I can tell you from what we're doing on Fogwa, and one is a classic co-op, which has its own messiness. There's nothing, I mean, nothing easy about the structure for sure. Uh, and we're set up in this charity social enterprise model, which again, I mean, uh, you know, we're, we're doing a fine job of keeping lawyers and accountants employed to, uh, you know, do the right thing and some stay on side with charity law and, and all the rest of it. So I often wondered uh, whether we uh, in Canada shouldn't have some body of legislation around community interest corporations that uh, would make this a little bit easier. Yeah, and I think there's some legislation in BC that Christy could probably articulate better than I can uh, around that. So we We've had, and, and Nova Scotia's had pockets of it, I think, you know, in terms of earlier on. Um, uh, so I think there's, you know, different facsimiles of these community interest, you know, sort of corporations that um, have, have shown up. I think, you know, we think we have a robust co-op movement in Canada and, I love co-ops. They are, and and the, there are certain times when employee ownership, you know, with through the trust model, it has a different sort of governance structure. It's not as far down the continuum of democratic, you know, voting, etc. So that's why we can get pension funds, a uh, kind of to support it because it looks like a more traditional governance structure in these employee ownership trusts. Uh, it's an independent board, um, but I think both totally have their place. It depends on what stage a company is at and, and the nature of it in terms of what the best form of these types of ownership is, community, employee, community, you know, kicks, CICs, or, 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 or various things. Um, we just need a lot more of it. And, and it's not either or, it's both. It's an and. and. It's yeah. An and. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you both. I wanted to bring it back to um, Big Capital, but we'll come back to that in a second because I know that there's some questions that are popping up in the chat that we want to get to from our attendees. So I'm going to just mosey this way. So let me just see what we got. So question, supporting local businesses can be difficult for all income brackets due to corporations typically being able to offer lower prices. So I guess it's saying like, it, is there... Um, you know, how do we make it easier for anyone to be able to support and buy from local businesses? Is there a cost differential in, in terms of, you know, putting your money and your investment in your and your 
capital into local businesses. I'm wondering if Zita, you can talk about that. Yeah, I I think that um, we it is easier, let's say, uh, for a Walmart to have the lowest price uh, compared to I don't know a, a locally owned hardware store, let's say, because they have global scale. They probably have more ruthless business models than the you know the locally owned hardware store and on and on and on. But if you need a nail, now you got to decide which one are you going to support. Um, I think in making that decision, it is always wise to think in, in a more holistic way. Uh, so if it's five dollars that's leaving your pocket, the five dollars that leaves your pocket and goes off to Walmart or, or pick I mean, it doesn't have to be Walmart. Pick any big global uh, uh, organization. Uh, is probably not going to do a lot to add to your value of your house if you're a lucky enough person to actually own a house or or help your neighbor uh, keep a job that they want to keep. So I think it's looking holistically at the fact that money that is spent in the local and stays in the local and moves around in the local enriches like with, I mean, financially as well as uh, any other way, enriches your life far more than the, that that immediate transaction because really if it's a locally owned business it's a transaction yes but it's actually a web of relationships that pays back in different ways but i know that's hard uh when you know you don't have a lot of money and you're looking at two things uh but where people can look at it in that way uh and if it's a head of cabbage and you know one is 49 cents and the other is 69 cents you know i'd say go for the 69 cents and I would add to that is this is some of the conversation we have with institutional purchasers is that they they have the ability to look a bit more at, at whole cost you know accounting and use their dollars for that local benefit and to encourage them to do that. And back to the head of question, cabbage, gonna, though, Christy, because that, yeah. the head of cabbage that grew locally yes. also has a much lower carbon footprint. Let's it not does, forget like, that. Yeah, so if we want to get to true cost pricing. True cost is the yeah is the yeah. piece right so that we're yeah. using our dollars in one way not circling around and yeah. trying to cover use other dollars to kind of deal with the impacts of these dollars yeah. so a question to bill can i just um, add one thing on that yeah. subject even though i know very little about it um uh i listened to this wonderful podcast this really smart uh woman who uh i thought i've got to i've got to learn more about her work and and of course now i can't remember the name or the, but it's on uh, pitchfork economics. So just I'll, I'll say for any of you who are interested in, you know, some really sort of thoughtful um, sort of discussion around, you know, how our uh, economy is owned and who, who benefits from it, et cetera. But she'd been studying uh, local businesses and the effect of the Walmarts and the Amazons. And she found out that Unlike what we think, uh, local businesses are often more efficient, et cetera, but there's some predatory stuff that goes on <laughs> to get rid of the local businesses, uh, you, you know, um, that, that they can't, you know, match or whatever. But anyway, it was a, you know, I, if, I'd, if I'd followed through on what I meant to follow through on, which is to delve into what she, her work more, I would have given a much more thoughtful answer, but I can at least direct you somewhere where if you're really interested in this subject, it was one of the one of the more recent podcasts on pitchfork economics podcast. We're looking it up, Bill. I was gonna say we'll yeah. track it down and put yeah. see if we can put it in the chat. <laughs> so on to the question and and um so this one person is talking about how one of the cases that they've seen is that businesses that are successful and grow. Um, then they get bought out by other larger businesses, often outside the community. And there's a question of saying, you know, what can be done in order to, to encourage companies that purchase businesses maybe to stay in the community, to continue to give back to the community and continue to invest and expand locally. We talked about employee ownership, you know, as an option. And I just want to point out for our experience on Vancouver Island is that the organizations, the companies tend to be smaller. And so if we're looking at small businesses, employee owner, like I don't know very many that have 900 employees, maybe some of the logging, those, you know, but um, but at a smaller level, what are some other ways that those businesses can can be stayed and owned and held in community or to encourage those buyers to, to keep businesses in community? Yeah, interestingly enough, I mean, 
to talk about the Taylor Guitars deal because we wanted to get institutional capital. Most of the employee ownership deals that happen in the U.S. Uh, and, and around the world are much smaller. I mean, so we're trying to connect the dots to larger ones because they, so, um, but what we haven't done a good enough job of collectively is uh, making sure business owners uh, know about this option and the way that it can be financed and structured. Again, that's one of the reasons why we would like to see, you know, a, a custom-made trust structure around it with targeted incentives. Uh, and, and because I think so many business owners, if they know, if they knew they could go this route, would not sell to someone who they, you know, even if they're telling them, oh no, we're gonna keep this business in the community. <laughs> they know, they know what's gonna happen in four or five years. And, and you know, if you look at where, and I shouldn't rail against private equity since, um, you know, there are a lot of good private equity players out there and, and a lot of good people, but boy, oh boy, the number of times a company is sold from one private equity buyer to another private equity buyer to another private equity buyer, um, you know, it's, it's, and, and you, you, you create wealth through financial engineering. Um, those aren't, that's not where we should be, you know, creating incentives, um, in my humble opinion. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more, Bill. And that's the, but to come back also to the, the question of our, around scale, part of the problem, uh, we, we do have a scale problem uh, because the, the more money aggregates into bigger and bigger pools, it gets very difficult for those pools to, you know, work at the smaller scales of most of the communities in our country. I mean, we probably have three or four major centers and everything else, people live in, you know, very different geographies of their very different scales. And, you know, whether you're talking about the Infrastructure Bank of Canada, which, you know, has a mandate and, and has intent and has desire uh, to get some things done, you know, one of the things we want to do on Fogo Island that's been talked about, you know, is we should have, you know, it's four times the size of Manhattan. We should have an electric bus that goes around Fogo Island, just continuously goes around. Uh, and okay, well, that should be a natural fit for something like an infrastructure bank, but it's too small. It's all too small. And every time I talk to anyone from, you know, small or medium sized communities, every time they try to do something with big capital, whether it's public or, or private, they're too small. So one of the things that we've, and on Fogo Island, we have a particular, uh, frightening ledge that we're, uh, looking at, which has to do with the fishing licenses, because as communities lose their fishing licenses, so they lose their future. But when fishers are ready to sell, because they too age um, and age out, out, where's the money on in a place like Fogo Island to buy these fishing lines? It's not there. And uh, banks have generally uh, that, you know, used to be super, very active in communities across the country lending. I think they, you know, like mostly have all packed up and gone home. And, you know, you, you have to talk to an algorithm if, if you even want a loan and, and that algorithm is not likely to give you one. And so with our community finance, um, with community economies pilot, one of the things we want to develop is a format for what we're calling a community finance fund. And we want to come up with a, with a generalized format that any community could adopt and come up with its governance structure that is a receptive vessel so that bigger pools of money uh, which, and I understand that these are too little a deals that they can't, I mean, how will they know who they should lend to in Estevan or Fogo Island? But if every one of the communities had a community finance fund that could receive incoming capital out of the system, whether it's impact investment capital or any, any capital, financial capital that wants to get out in the world, because I, I do think, as Bill said, there are lots of good people in the world, and I think more good than not good. And if the plumbing existed for them to place money in community finance funds that could be administered at the local level where the knowledge lives, uh, then I think we might have a part of the puzzle solved, because then we could get the scale right for each community as well. All right, I'm continuing to make my way through the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Here's one, I guess, for me, based on your experience, where's the greatest opportunity for growing local ownership here on South Island? What's needed to tangibly support this? 
Um, so uh, the work that we're looking at in terms of the business legacies initiative that we're doing with uh, rural roads is to look at how we can develop a community business trust model. Um, you know, we looked initially at how more nonprofits and charities are growing social enterprises and could they acquire existing businesses and transition them into social enterprises as a model. And that works for nonprofits and charities that have assets or capital to work with already. Um, and with rural roads, we're like, how do we do that at scale? So how do we create a vehicle that will allow the acquisition of a number of businesses into, into a community business trust model that then can be owned by community with the profits going back into community? So that I would say is there's opportunity there. And right now we're currently mapping what is owned um, in community ownership already in, in Cowichan Valley in the South region to look at what's already there, because we're not only worried about the, the transition of private businesses um, out of community, but also nonprofit assets that currently exist and are held being lost to community ownership. So we're looking at those two areas and trying to find a vehicle that can say, yes, we'll take that and own it and bring it back into community profits. So I think that there is um, there's some very cool models that are taking place that we can inspire and learn from each other. And in order to tangibly support that, it's like the lawyers and accountants to do this kind of stuff is, is a lot. <laughs> so people who want to contribute that kind of capacity and knowledge and contribution into community into community ownership models is really helpful and um, and and to come around as well as being able to flow resources and capital to be able to make and, and support those transitions. So that would be my thought on that. Um, capital is one thing accessing it is another. Uh, what needs to change when it comes to accessibility of capital to support local ownership? Bill, do you want to take this one? Yeah, I think Zita did a good job on sort of talking about that. Anyway, what I would add, you know, one of the way, one of the things we think we are, which sounds strange, is we think we're an R and D arm for institutional capital um, to to bring them opportunities. They won't find themselves that meet all their risk-adjusted rates of return hurdles, etc. But will actually make the world a better place. Um, you need. Um, you know, <laughs> those of us who are, you know, on this panel and probably many in the audience have been trying to work in this hybrid world uh, of trying to say, how do you marry market forces and doing good? And, and most of the people with capital have only been working in one world. Uh, so it's not readily apparent sometimes where those, you know, uh, opportunities are, but I think that's, or at least we think that's our task in this hybrid world. And back to your original question, why we sort of moved from where we were, where we were, we couldn't be prouder of our social enterprise phase, but we thought, you know, we may be, you know, <laughs> Our fate may be an interesting magazine article because <laughs> people like to write about it and they like to, you know, tell us to keep up the good work, but but they don't see how it applies to them. We have to make this apply to the big capital sources, and there are ways to do it. And 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 you know, I think employee ownership is a great example of that, but there are others, and and you know, we have to figure out uh, how to create a compelling value proposition for institutional capital to be doing things that work for local economies. And that's our, you know, that's kind of our task. Zita, I'd like you to take a run at that. How do we create a compelling value proposition for big capital to make a difference in local economies? What do you think is possible? What do you think is the, the real value that's offered? Yeah, I think that um, people who are managing big capital are people. And they lay their heads down somewhere as well. And I begin, every day by believing and ending every day by believing that uh, everybody gets up in the morning and wants to do their best. And so I think that if we can build the plumbing, which I, I really think this needs to come from the ground up, from communities up, but we can build a plumbing that they can work with, that will happen. And all those pension funds, they're, they're us. I mean, that this is, they're us. And so whether you're teachers or public servants or whoever, if we all got up tomorrow morning and, and asked the people who manage our funds to say, you know, we would like you to invest 2% in Canadian communities. Oh, and look, they've come up with a new network of community finance. We would like you to invest this much 
Uh, and we accept, I mean, I think one of the most dangerous things that goes around in the world right now is this uh, belief that no return has to be given up in order to fix climate or or fix any of the, of course, we have to give up a little return, uh, at least in a, a short time, maybe over, I think the return is there over a longer time horizon, but the return is also broader than just financial. So I, I think we just all need to be a little more grown up and about that. And I I don't think that a priori, anybody running, well, maybe there are a few uh, that get up in the morning and say, I'm just going to extract as much money. As I don't really care what, what uh, damage is done. Uh, I don't think that's the majority of people managing money. So I just think that we need to have the kind of conversations we're having today. We need to build the plumbing. And then we as citizens need to encourage the people that are managing our money, as Bill says, pension funds are stewards for, for the most of us. Uh, so we just have to ask them to behave differently because all we're, what we're talking about here is how do we get money to behave differently? And so how do you get money to behave differently is how do we get people to behave differently? Well, we just need new models and, uh, and, and, and really it's about tying the consequences and rewards need to be closer together in geography. Great. Well, I got told that 1157, I was going to get cut off. <laughs> We're going to get cut off. Um, I just want to thank both of you for, first of all, the amazing work that you're doing, you know, in your communities, in the world, in the US, in Canada, and working to not only make a difference at the local level, but find models to, to share that out and scale that to other communities that could benefit from that. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for all that you're doing um, to, to build a stronger community and, and future for all of us. And thank you everyone who participated today. Thank you, Christy. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you, Christy, Zeta and Bill for the really engaging conversation. Uh, I look forward to, to digging into, um, you know, many of the, the examples and, and, and ideas you raised today. Uh, thank you also to our sponsor, Check News, for sponsoring this important conversation. Thank you to our presenting sponsor, RBC, and our innovation sponsor, BC Ferries, for supporting Rising Economy Week. But thanks again to the attendees. Really appreciated the questions that were coming through the chat uh, and through the Q&A. We encourage you to head back to the Hoover platform to continue the conversation. There you can check out the event agenda and, and uh, the remaining sessions for this week uh, and head to the community section to check out the exhibitor booths and join virtual meetups. Up next at noon uh, Pacific, you can catch Ragwa Gopal, CEO of Innovate BC in a Czech spotlight. Uh, and this afternoon, our final event for, for Rising Economy Week, uh, we have Innovation in Real Places, a keynote by Dan Bresnitz, uh, and now award-winning author Dan Bresnitz. Uh, this event's taking place in person and virtually. Uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you. <laughs>